everyone. And today we're going to do the last module of the course. Um, this is about Karl Polanyi. So uh, we're going to um, look at Polanyi's historical contribution uh, to political economy. But what we'll see is that Polanyi also contributed to another discipline, which is sociology. Um, people have taken his economic methods and historical methods and applied them to sociology. He's the founder of what's called substantivism. Uh, and substantivism's point is kind of one of the overall points that we've looked at this semester is that when we look at the economy, we can't look at it by itself. Um, we've got to connect it to other aspects such as the way society and culture works. Um, Polanyi's most famous work is called The Great Transformation. And we're going to look at some of the key concepts in The Great Transformation um, today. So just a bit of background on Polanyi. He was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Vienna in 1886. Uh, he was from a Jewish family and um, this, this experience of Jewishness, I guess, and, uh, you know, um, would shape his life journey. Uh, we're going to see that he graduated from Budapest University in law. Um, so not in economics, not in uh, political economy, not in um, any of the social sciences, really, uh, but would make an impact this way in 1912. So in the First World War, he served as a cavalry officer in the Austro-Hungarian army. He survives the war, uh, and that's sort of important. Um, he goes on to um, greater things. The Austro-Hungarian Empire does not. It collapses after the war. Um, and then uh, there's a new state of Hungary, which has a revolution. Now, Polanyi supported Mihaly Karolyi, uh, who was a social democrat and uh, at the time he gets overthrown by the communist revolutionary Bela Kun. Um, so Polanyi is already on the wrong side of <laughs> the wrong side of a political struggle um, and ends up leaving Hungary. So uh, he goes to Austria um, and immediately he's in a fight again. So he's in a fight with the Austrian School of Economics. So a lot of the early neoclassical thinkers who we looked at um, earlier on in the course and the Austrian School uh, pretty close to what ends up being the neoclassical economics school uh, and their methods are heavily mathematical, heavily statistical. And Polanyi had a problem with this. He said, well, your methods seem rigorous, but they have nothing to do with the way the economy actually works. Um, interestingly, he gets married to a Hungarian Communist Party member, Ilona Duczynska, um, and this makes his life even more difficult because he um, gets a job at Columbia University in the United States. And this is a time where communists were persecuted in the United States. And so um, he, he could not get a visa for her. Okay, so he ends up living in Canada and traveling every day across the border to New York for work. Polanyi would write about a lot of things, but the great transformation is his uh, most important work. Uh, in 1944, uh, he publishes this book and the basic argument of this book is that if we look at the modern nation state and the modern market economy, we shouldn't see these things as separate things, right? These are parts, uh, two parts of a singular thing, which he called the market society. Now, market society is a big social transformation. That's why the book's called The Great Transformation. Um, why is it the case? Because in most of human history, the market as an institution has played a very small part in the way that we live, right? A very small part in the economy and a very small part in the society, right? So um, Polanyi is famous for saying man's economy as a rule is submerged in his social relationships. Let's see a little bit what that means. So uh, more or less um, Polanyi founds what's called the formalist substantivist debate. And uh, he's credited with starting this debate which produced a lot of uh, fascinating research about the interaction between the economy and the society. Okay, if we take a term like economics, uh, Polanyi proposes that it has two different meanings. There's the formalist meaning, um, which is economics is the logic of fully informed rational decisions made between different economic possibilities with the aim of maximizing utility. You know, what we looked at uh, when we studied the neoclassical economists. Then there's the substantivist meaning of economics Economics is the study of how humans make a living from their social and natural environment, where the strategy a society adopts involves adapting to its own material conditions, which may or may not involve maximizing utility, right? Same word, two different meanings. We can understand economics both ways, I guess. Um, he obviously thinks that one way is more legitimate than the other, but I guess it points to when we use a word like economics, I guess, um, 
you know, there's many different ways we can look at studying, studying a concept like that and applying the study of the economy in general. So the formalists borrow from neoclassical economics and they argue that this individual is going to make rational choices based on full information um, or sometimes incomplete information and maximize whatever that person considers to be valuable. Okay, so these preferences might change um, and the information about the choices may or may not be complete. You know, there was an economist, Herbert Simon, who came up with the idea of bounded rationality um, and won the Nobel Prize for it. But even Simon's criticism of, um, of the uh, you know, rational decision-maker hypothesis is to say that, well, okay, we're still rational, but we just make rational decisions based on imperfect information. Okay, so the basic principles of economizing and maximizing our utility still apply in every case. We're aggressively attempting to maximize our position at all times. On the other hand, um, substantivist economics focuses on um, the social institutions that surround people's livelihoods. So um, where as individuals are we connected? Uh, the market is just one of many social institutions that helps decide how economic transactions take place. So the substantive economy is what, and this is a quote, an instituted process of interaction between man and his environment, which results in a continuous supply of want satisfying material needs. In other words, institutions are all around us, political institutions, social institutions, moral institutions, and cultural institutions. And we use these things to do various stuff, right? Um, we use them to understand the world around us, you know, to give it meaning, um, to, to, we use the knowledge that we have comes from our social institutions. Um, we use these institutions to decide what our goal is, you know, what a good life is, what right and wrong is, um, what, our, what, what our personal goals are going to be, how we achieve them. Um, we use these institutions to decide what and for whom we produce things, right? So we use these institutions to decide who the economy actually serves and what percentage of the economy we spend on different things. We use these institutions to decide on what we want. Right? So when we've got money to spend on wants, um, we use these institutions to help decide what we want. You know, is it, is it, is, was Veblen right? Do we want fancy stuff or, you know, do we want necessities or do we want to save money and save it for later or whatever? You know, but we're going to use these political, social, moral and cultural institutions to decide what we're going to do with the resources we have. So if this is true, when we study the economy, if we study it without thinking about the political and the socio-cultural context, you'll never understand the economy. Right? The substantivist point is whenever we study the economy, we are always also studying human psychology. We are always also studying political and social and moral and cultural institutions. We're always studying the society and the social context to economic decision-making. And if we're not, we're gonna be wrong. So um, Polanyi argued that in most human history, the market has not played a very big role at all, right? Um, it's at best had an impact on long distance trade. Okay, so for example, um, if you know that you have something uh, that is fairly abundant in the place that you are, and you know that the thing is fairly expensive far, far away, you know, the relative balance between supply and demand might motivate you to take that thing far, far away and sell it, you know, and you end up with things like the Silk Route uh, or stuff like that. Okay, but for most um, decision making that we make about the economy, Polanyi will argue that our economic exchanges have been based on a combination of three different types of decision making. The first is redistributive. So trade in production focuses on a tribal chief or a feudal lord, you know, whoever is the head of the society, who then redistributes part of the product to the society. Right? So we focus our resources towards this head of the society, who then allocates different bits of that resources to the rest of the society, right? Redistribution. Next, reciprocity. So exchanges are made of goods for goods between different parts of the society, right? We internally barter and exchange and that sort of thing. We do things for each other, okay? Moral reciprocity. And thirdly, we have what's called householding. So much of the economy in human history is where households produce their own stuff, grow our own food, make our own clothes, make our own tools for consumption and use, okay? Um, and if we add all of these things together and think, well, historically, um, what percentage of things, uh, what percentage of human economic activity 
is covered under redistribution, reciprocity and householding. And then we would be forced to conclude most of it. Now, the issue here is that the market does not play a role in any of these things. So the key thing here is that the economy is being structured around social relationships and people are only using the market to get things that were otherwise unimaginable, you know, otherwise completely unobtainable. So if you're in a cold place and you want some sugar, you're going to use the market. If you want almost anything else, you're going to depend on redistribution, reciprocity or householding. You know, um, that, that's the point. So Polanyi in general is going to argue that, you know, this modern market society is not possible without the creation of a modern state, which is interesting because these days we talk about a battle between the forces of the market and the forces of government and the state. Okay, so he's going to completely contradict this neoclassical argument that the state is holding back the development of a free market society. You know, the neoclassical economists argue government is restricting this spontaneous behavior of individuals, you know, Adam Smith's invisible hand, and they're hurting the economy in doing so by applying regulation or planning or government decision making, where so called hurting the economy. Okay, Polanyi responds by saying actually, the free market required the greatest amount of planning and social intervention in history. Um, and people are spontaneously reacting against it to protect themselves. Right? So he looks at human politics as being natural and normal responses to this imposition of the free market. So the free market is seen as attempting to separate itself from society and from these social relationships. And society is responding to it by trying to protect itself from the negative consequences of the market. So what we see there is it's impossible to separate the study of the economy from the study of society because there's an inherent link here. The market tries to free itself, the society tries to regain control over the market. You know, the economy is therefore an inherently political process. So one key concept that Polanyi came up with is a fictitious commodity. And uh, the simple way of looking at a fictitious commodity is to say, it's something that we treat as a commodity, but unlike other commodities, this thing was not produced for the market. Let's look at some good examples, land, labor, and money. Okay. Now, if we remember back to our study of Marxism, we know that commodities have a use and an exchange value. And if we apply that definition to each of these things, um, we would say, okay, land has a use and exchange value. Labor has a use and exchange value. Money has a use and exchange value. Aren't these commodities? Polanyi will say, well, yes, they were commodities, but what holds, what ties these things together is that we never came and created those things in order to sell them. Land was never created in the first place. It just is, you know, labor, when people get born and when people rise up to a working age, we didn't do that so as to sell them on the marketplace, right? And we don't make money or currency in order to sell it, okay? It's, 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 it has a different purpose. So Polanyi and other people who follow in his tradition have argued that when we treat things like land, labor, and money as commodities, when they're not really commodities, we cause major social instability, right? Um, so when these public goods and social necessities are treated as if they're commodities produced for sale in the market, rather than protected rights, our social world is endangered and major crises will ensue, right? Um, we know if we treat the money like any other commodity, we can get a financial crisis. If we treat labor like any other commodity, we get, you know, we, we mistreat people, we exploit people. If we treat land like any other commodity, we can ruin the environment, or we can encourage speculation and stuff like that. So these things aren't really commodities in the way that shirts or iPhones or watches or shoes are commodities. The next key concept in Polanyi is what's called embeddedness. This is um, where we say embeddedness is fixed, something that's fixed firmly and deeply in a surrounding mass, right? That's the common English meaning of embeddedness, right? Something that's buried in something else, okay? So for Polanyi, um, human nature says economic decision making is not about individual choice. When we make a decision, this decision is the product of and is shaped by a bunch of things. Social relationships, cultural values, morals, politics, even religion help decide the decisions that we make. Right? They structure our economic decisions. So if all of these things are having an impact on our economic decisions, why do we treat them as separate? Um, we should treat them as part of the economy, 
right? So rather than being separate from the society, the economy is embedded in society, embedded in all of these social institutions and all the economic exchanges that take place, even market exchanges um, are regulated by these social institutions. So any economic analysis that we do needs to consider the social and political context, okay? And any analysis that does not consider the social and political context is seen as immediately incorrect. And we can throw out any analysis that doesn't consider the surrounding social relationships, cultural values, morality, politics, and all that stuff. Next, we can look at another concept, which is the double movement. This is probably the more difficult concept in Polanyi. So um, he's using this concept to explain the way the developing economy and society works together. Free market reformers are going to come up at any point and say, wouldn't it be a great idea to disembed the economy from its social relationships? Let's commodify everything. Let's create fictitious commodities. Let's do all that stuff. You know, won't we get better economic development if this occurs? And the response is always going to be a counter movement. And this is where some aspect of society tries to re-embed the economy within society again. It does things like create labor laws, create tariffs, socialize ownership, or protect itself in some way. All right. So what we see then is that this attempt to create a free market is socially destructive. And the more the market is free, the bigger the social reaction against the free market. And this is an inevitable point. All right. So the double movement is the movement to free the market. That's the one area and the movement to control the market that happens in reaction. That's the double part. So part of Polanyi's concept is the criticism of some parts of Marxism, but also some parts of free market thinking. Now, Polanyi thinks that, well, if Marxists make one big mistake, maybe they underestimate, some Marxists underestimate the role of the state. And they're saying, well, we're, we're looking at so much at this conflict between workers and capitalists. Um, isn't the state important as an independent entity um, from the workers and capitalists? We can look at Marx's famous statement that the executive of the modern state is nothing but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. Right here, Marx is basically saying the state is not an independent entity of its own. Um, the state exists to represent some certain class, right? In this case, the capitalist class, the bourgeoisie. So Polanyi says, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. The political conflict the context where this conflict happens is also important. So um, if the market is unable to do one thing, it certainly can't produce a social order, right? And many of the commodities produced by the market are fictitious. So what that means is that government planning is necessary to influence things like the labor supply. You know, it does this through population policy and immigration policy, for example influence the money supply, which it does through monetary policy, and it influences major decisions about land use, you know, where we're going to put a factory, where we're going to put a commercial sector, where we're going to just keep for residential areas, that sort of thing. So Polanyi's analysis says that actually the political culture of a state and the surrounding social order that the state creates are really important and can decide exactly what type of society that we have, as well as what type of economy we have. So we know that capitalism has expanded. I think that's a fair assumption to make in the last, you know, since the Industrial Revolution until now. Okay, and markets have also expanded their role, especially in the last 30 years. And that's sort of now we're living in an age where the role of markets is at least contested and maybe declining somewhat um, and the state's becoming more important again. So the big problem that Polanyi highlights is that if markets are dependent on states, um, states are in this international competition, right? So because of international competition, the big weakness is the international system um, because there's no world government. And so all the states are kind of in this weird competitive framework. Um, for Polanyi, that's a big weakness. So the next additional weakness is that individual societies are going to try and re-embed the market within their society frameworks, right? So Polanyi is in a way, explaining the rise of nationalism as a function of economic globalization. And he's saying that, well, um, the, for the market's going to try and free itself. Everybody's going to panic. Everybody's going to feel like, oh, we need to get some control back. Um, nationalism is one way that um, we, we can get control back by trying to articulate national identities in response to economic globalization. 
So Polanyi predicted the rise of nationalism as a result of economic globalization. We have to decide whether we think his theory is convincing enough as an explanation for modern nationalism. So if you believe Polanyi so far um, and you're in the government and looking for advice, you know, um, if you believe what Polanyi is saying, government and political leaders have a really difficult job. You know, they've got a balance between giving the market just enough freedom for the domestic economy to function, but they've also got to make sure the market doesn't dominate society. Because if you turn people into commodities, they start getting really upset about it. All right, so if we give too much priority to the free market, we will create social instability. This is the argument that people like Veblen or Keynes or even Marx made. Um, if we give too much priority to social protection, um, this is going to limit economic expansion. And if other nations expand their economies faster than ours, then that means we fall behind in this international competition of nations. All right, so we start to lose the contest. So government has a really tough job as a result. Um, you should not envy the difficulty of government. I'm going to use China here um, just briefly as a case study of how we can apply Polanyi's theory. Okay, so we should know that from 1978 until roughly 2007, um, China followed a developed model where, you know, um, if we follow Polanyi's concepts, um, they were focusing a lot on the freedom of the market as being an important aspect of their development. You know, so this led to a huge economic expansion, but simultaneously, it generated some social and political instability, um, partly as a result of rising inequality and corruption. You know, so especially after Deng Xiaoping's southern tour in 1992, the second wave of liberalization, um, what we can see is that the share of GDP that went to labor and household consumption declined over time, and the disposable income of China's top 10% of income earners grew significantly. Right? So the consequence of allowing the market to um, free itself was rising inequality and social instability a little bit. You know, the other big problem, which we're seeing the effects of now, is that it made China dependent somewhat on exports, and in particular, exports to the United States. You know, now they're talking about a dual circulation strategy as a way of sort of rebalancing the economy back to the domestic framework a bit more and becoming less dependent on export production. So if Polanyi is right, and we see liberalization of a market, um, what we should expect to see also is a counter movement. The double movement should occur, right? Where there's an attempt to reinvent the market within society again. And do we see evidence of this? I think we can, All right? So in China, you see the scientific development policy, uh, which is shifting China from a low wage manufacturing economy to a high value added industry and service based economy. Um, there's an explicit government policy to reduce its dependency on imports and foreign investment. Um, and now even more so as a result of the trade war with the United States. And there's an explicit government policy to raise the level of household consumption. You know, so next, there's a harmonious society platform. Um, this is a way of promoting social, inst social stability by reducing the inequality between people and between regions of China. So between rich and poor provinces and between rich and poor generally. Right? So we can also look at the stimulus plan that happened after the 2008 financial crisis as a response to you know, this freeing of the market. Um, where, where government is taking control again and directing the economy in certain important ways. Um, there's various laws we can point to that look at China's efforts to re-embed the economy within the society. The labor contract law decommodifies labor somewhat. The stimulus package, the health reform decommodifies health somewhat. Um, the social security law decommodifies labor again. Um, the increase in provincial minimum wages gives workers greater control over what they get paid and the increase of taxes for state-owned enterprises, right? These are all examples of the market um, having its influence reduced, you know? So it, it's what we should expect, you know, if we follow Pliny's theory, um, it's making a good prediction about what's actually gonna take place. So the result of some of these experiences um, during the post 2007 period where the country is re, sort of re-embedding the market within society. We see lower GDP growth, not low by any means, still extremely fast growing economy, but lower than before GDP growth. Um, we see that the Gini index begins to decline, and this is a way of measuring the society's economic inequality. Um, China starts becoming a more equal place over time during this period. Um, we see higher levels of wage growth, you know, so 
um, wages are starting to rise faster. And we see that the labor share of GDP stabilized for the first time since 1978. In other words, you know, there was a trend where the labor share of production was going down. And during this period, it stopped going down. It stopped, it didn't necessarily rise. I'm not sure about the latest data, but it didn't rise um, to the best of my knowledge, but it stopped declining. Consumption certainly grew. People are consuming more in China than any point in history. Um, and it's as a result of this recent period. And we saw that exports as a percentage of GDP fell. You know, so much of what Polanyi predicted about re-embedding the economy within society, um, gaining control over the market, you know, this, this was a real experience and this actually happened. You know, and it's, it's supported by the evidence. So this struggle that's ongoing between freeing the market and controlling the market highlights Polanyi's double movement concept, All right? So if we look on the one hand in China, since Xi Jinping's leadership, um, we see that there's announcements of comprehensively deepening reform and giving the market a decisive role. So these are very statements along the lines of let's free the market a little bit. You know, on the other hand, um, there's ideas like the Chinese dream or the anti-corruption campaign or the environmental protection campaign, or even this goal of a moderately prosperous society which China now believes it's become, or the end of poverty by 2020, which it believes it's achieved or going to achieve. All of these are policies attempting to re-embed the market within society, right? So this is ongoing struggle between the market trying to free itself and the society trying to bring the market back under control, right? And if you follow Polanyi, you think, well, you know, this is what my theory predicts. And I think I'm doing a good job. So what can we learn from Polanyi um, if you follow his theory, if you read his book, if you pay attention to his concepts? We learn that the modern market society and the modern nation state seem to be joined together. Now, for some reason, um, the market and all of its supporters, it's the capitalist class, um, all the people who benefit from the market, are always trying to free the market from society, right? They're always trying to free the market and make it its own independent entity. But the end result of this is almost always social instability. And there's always going to be a counter movement to try and bring the economy back in line to its original purpose, right? The reason the economy exists is to serve social needs. It's to serve human needs. So bring the economy back to what its original purpose was, right? Polanyi also teaches us that a lot of the things we think of as commodities are not commodities, right? Land, labor, money. They're not really commodities. They're not manufactured for the purpose of sale. Okay. So when we treat these things like commodities, we're going to cause major problems. Lastly, um, we can learn from Polanyi that we can't understand the economy through maths, right? Um, maths can help, maybe. Uh, but more important than the mathematics is the political and social context in which economic decisions are made, right? We need to understand the surroundings of our economic thinking and decision making. And Polanyi teaches us to focus on the context if we want to understand the economy. So that's it for the course, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed this look into political economy. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk about Carl Polanyi today. Thanks for listening.